2017 has been a difficult year for the South African economy. A mercantile bank economic review highlights that the country lost its investment grade status for foreign currency denominated debt uh, by S&P Global as well as Fitch, as well as its investment grade status for local currency denominated debt. The country suffered a technical recession where GDP contracted by 0.7% in the first quarter of 2017 following a 0.3% contraction in the last quarter of 2016. High unemployment rates persisted and hit 14-year highs at 27%. Young people in South Africa are most affected by this. The unemployment rate for youth was 55.9% in the second quarter of 2017. In the second quarter of 2017, South Africa was lifted out of the recession due to growth in agriculture at 33.6%, as well as the finance sector. Petrol prices increased and South Africans are said to be paying more for petrol than they have previously done at 14.49 and 14.46 rand for a litre of 93 and 95 octane petrol in December. The last time prices were this high was in April 2014 when the prices of 93 and 95 hit 14 rand 16 and 14 rand 39 respectively. The National Credit Regulator has told Parliament that consumer debt in South Africa had reached the 1.6 trillion rand mark. A recent World Bank index revealed that South Africa is one of the most indebted countries in the world. Now for more on this, Trudy Makaya from Mercantile Bank joins me in studio. Thanks so much for your time on SABC News. This report states that policy uncertainty, especially when it comes to fiscal policy, is one of the problems that we're seeing these economic difficulties in South Africa. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, if we trace back how we got into this difficulty, uh, when we had the Great Recession globally, um, a lot of governments, including our own, tried to spend their way out of it. So the private sector was struggling, economic growth was low, so government tried to compensate. And in so doing, um, obviously it didn't raise taxes because the economy was weak, so it had to borrow a lot of money. So our debt to GDP ratio came from a very modest 27% or so of GDP to the levels where it's at now, where in the latest medium term budget, it seemed to be heading towards 50% over the next three years. Mm -hmm. So we have this indebtedness burden, which, you know, the theory would go in a difficult time, you spend your way out of it, it boosts the economy, the economy grows, therefore you can repay. Now that theory didn't play out because the economy is still weak all these many years after the Great Recession. So we don't have that extra growth that will fund the debt that we've accumulated all of, you know, all these years. So then the question becomes, how do you fill that gap? And I think this is where the fiscal uncertainty comes in to say you've got this great level of indebtedness you also have fairly weak state-owned enterprises which keep demanding more resources from the state and once again you're going to worsen your fiscal position and you also have these plans that are out there where there aren't any definitive um, answers say the nuclear uh, plan mm -hmm. so the question is you're in a bit of a hole there's uncertainty as if you're going to dig yourself deeper into that hole given the different statements that are being made and there isn't a clear outcome about how we're going to resolve this. And I think that has hung over the market um, for most of this year. How does operating in such a difficult climate affect small businesses in particular because they're one of the drivers of economic growth in our country? So when there are perceptions that the economy is risky internationally, but even by, by local players, uh, let's say especially financiers, the banking sector, private equity, even all the way uh, to small business financiers. And it becomes that much more difficult for small businesses to raise the finance that they need uh, to run their operations. Mm -hmm. It also becomes quite difficult to achieve scale uh, because a lot of, for a lot of small businesses, what really makes the difference is being able to reach a particular size where the business can fund itself. Now, it becomes that much more difficult um, to reach that level. And also then the risks of bankruptcies and business failures become so much higher um, than would be the case in a more stable and um, certain economic outlook. Mm -hmm. Finance Minister Malusi Gigaba taking an overview, taking a look at the South African economy and saying he's going to implement a 14-point plan in order to rescue South African economy. Are we seeing the effects of that and how much is that comforting the market and possible investors in South Africa? I think there have been some reforms um, in line of uh, that have been announced in terms of that plan. So, you know, reforming um, boards at, at some state-owned uh, state enterprises that has happened. 
Um, there's been legislation that's been finalized that has been pending. But there's also other things that are still outstanding, you know, in the telecom sector, issues around spectrum, um, around digital migration. Um, there's still questions um, around uh, black economic empowerment rules. So, you know, there, there's been some progress, but I think there's still big questions. I think the other uncertainty is that in trying to close the gap, will there be measures that also undermine growth? So are we mm. expecting that next year there'll be tax increases that hurt those very middle income households that you talk about that are indebted? Are there going to be tax increases that hurt business? Um, so these are the questions where, you know, whatever solutions are on the table, it's clear that there's a bigger structural reform that needs to happen. And it's not clear who's going to pay, pay the sacrifice mm. uh, for that and what the outcome for growth is going to be. I think the other thing about the 14-point plan was that a lot of the things that were done were kind of like a to-do list of urgent tasks, right? But there are also big policy questions that are still outstanding. Um, so, you know, it looks like we've kind of forgotten the NDP. Um, there's also been another interesting policy process led, that, led by a former president, Mutlante, assessing legislation and kind of suggesting ways to improve um, the economy, dealing with the land question, even dealing with social cohesion. Um, you know, there's, there's been a body of work that shows everything that's gone wrong and potential solutions, but it's not clear who's going to pick up those potential solutions. Mm -hmm. So you can fix things in the short term, but how are you really going to restructure how South African mm -hmm. cities work? Um, and the question is, you know, is this in government's plan going forward for the rest of this term and also for the next term to fix those much bigger questions? Mm -hmm. I think uh, not only government, but business also has a responsibility to make sure that our economy comes back on track, implementing some of the solutions that you spoke about. As citizens as well, people do need to play their role. We're seeing a 50.8 billion rand tax shortfall. Is this due to people saying they can see things that are happening in the media? People, some people have said they don't want to pay their taxes if other people aren't paying their taxes or complying with the law. Is this a business um, tax thing? What's really happening there? Do you know, I think we don't have good evidence so far on this idea of people are complying less. Okay. I mean, what is clear, for instance, is that personal income tax has kind of saved the day, been uh, the greatest contributor to tax collection. So people are, ordinary people are still paying taxes. You might raise questions about wealthier individuals, corporate taxes, uh, whether they come into the party. What is clear is that, you know, it's a basic rule. The economy slows down, your tax revenues, you know, are not going to come from thin air. So this economic slowdown really uh, took a knock on tax revenues. I think that's what we can say for certain. Okay. In terms of compliance, I think we need a bit more. Um, of evidence from the tax authorities to show that there, there really has been a gaming of the system. We do know that at the broader level, there is an issue around revenues being diverted, you know, the whole profit shifting situation. Um, so I could never say that we're perfect when it comes to compliance. But um, to say this current shortfall is all about compliance, I think would be a bit, um, you know, we need more evidence um, to establish that. Trudy Mukai, thanks so much for your time on SABC News. She's a consulting economist from Mercantile Bank. It's time for a short break. I have more business news for you when you come back. Please stay with us.